shine on us all, set us free. Love is the answer. Greetings from Castle Gory and from me, King Aurora, and from me, Aurora is knocking us over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. And <laughs> poor Mickey's <laughs> gasping for breath <laughs> because uh, she was trying to climb down. I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> Aurora was lunging up. Well, today we are going to be celebrating the late Queen's life and remembering her. So, of course, that will involve her relations and the difficulties she had with them. But that will only be a part of the whole. We will be speaking about her life from birth to death. Okay? So without further ado, if I may, I will plunge right in by saying, I liked the Queen. She was sweet, she was down to earth, she was friendly, without being chummy, she was gracious, she was kind, she really was a true Christian. And to those of you who don't know, uh, there is a little anecdote about the Queen and my eldest dog, Tum Tum in Tum Tum's memoirs, which are called With Love from Pet Heaven by Tum Tum the Springer Spaniel, which shows a very sweet side of the Queen. But I'm not going to go into that because that will take too long. As we all know, she died the most revered head of state on earth. You don't get that sort of respect unless you have earned it. I actually think a lot of people thought that it was really sad that she died when she did. Because had the Queen died this year, this time, a lot of the uncertainty that hovered over her head as she was dying would have been cleared up. For instance, remember she was privy to the disastrous trip of the Prince and Princess of Wales in the West Indies. Uh, she was privy to the fact that the Commonwealth was under assault as a result of Harry and Meghan's feeding negativity in a way that was totally uncalled for and they should never have done. She also died when at least, well, we'll get to all of that. We'll get to all of that. I don't want to jump the gun. What I will say is everyone expected her to live a little bit longer. People knew she was dying. She had bone cancer. But... When she died, nobody really expected her to die then. Well, let me rephrase that. The day before her death, if you'd asked anybody close to her, does she have any time left? They'd have said yes, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months, maybe with a bit of luck, even a year, at least to her next birthday which was in April, uh, but they wouldn't have expected her to die. But this is what happens with people who have various forms of cancer. They don't necessarily die of the cancer. They die of the effects of the cancer upon their body. So it was a bit of a shock that she died when she did. But it was not a total surprise, let's put it that way. 
I'm going to speak a little bit about the duality of her role as both a queen and a person. She tried within her daily life to embody all the virtues of a queen, a good queen, and she succeeded. But there was a duality because Lilibet, the woman, and Elizabeth, the queen, although they cohabited, so to speak, there were significant differences. For instance, in her personal life, she was a lot more phlegmatic and a lot more accommodating and a lot more easygoing than she was as a monarch. She was very punctilious as a monarch. She was very aware of the fact that at all times she must do her duty and never slip up. So she was more vigilant, really, as a monarch than she was as a private individual. Another way of looking at it is nobody can maintain that peace for 24-7 and therefore she something had to give and it gave in her personal life, which however, coincided with her personality and her religious beliefs because she was an extremely devout Christian. She believed very firmly in God. She believed very firmly in her role as the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. She embraced her destiny, which is why she did it so well. If you embrace your destiny, you are much better at fulfilling it than if you buck against it. And she never, ever bucked against it. From she was a little girl, she was dutiful, thoughtful, considerate, very orderly. She was not neurotic, however but she was very punctilious. Notwithstanding her being very religious, she was not as questing spiritually as Prince Philip was. Prince Philip's mother, if you remember, was a nun. His mother's aunt had been a nun and became a saint. So religious uh, interest, shall we say, ran in both sides of the family because Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's grandfather had been a minister, church minister, not government minister. So she came from a religious family on both sides. But she was not, I mean, Prince Philip used to read all sorts of esoteric books and wanting to delve into the meaning of life and the purpose of life and uh, all sorts of esoterica, which the Queen never involved herself with. She was a far more simple and some people would have said at times simplistic person than he was. She was not an intellectual, but she was on the ball like you couldn't believe and bright as a button. You only needed to look at her dancing eyes to see that this was a woman who was vital, also very humorous. Her personality was a very interesting one because notwithstanding her extreme dutiful aspect and the dedication with which she set about becoming an exemplary monarch, she was very fun loving, very sociable. She had a great sense of humor. 
she was an excellent host hostess i should say because she wasn't a host she was a hostess um, falling into modern bad practices she was an excellent hostess she was a very good guest which princess margaret her sister wasn't but she was a very good guest she was very accommodating very easy no fuss no trouble she had genuine warmth notwithstanding the fact that she could be very reserved she would often summarize something in a sentence or a few words uh, so she was very to the point she was warm she was very loyal she was very accepting and she was very forgiving she was really much easier company than prince philip i've got to tell you although i just adored him i thought he was just divine but he had an acerbic aspect to his personality which she to an extent shared i've got to tell you but with her it was in a witticism with him it sometimes came across as sharpness and he could sometimes appear to be awkward although i think he was just simply trying to deflate the pomposity around him she was a very earthy very earthy you can't be a countrywoman loving horses and dogs and country pursuits sporting pursuits the way she did for instance she would go out with the guns and she would pick up birds and very matter of fact if a bird had not been cleanly shot she would wring its neck which is what you're supposed to do you're not supposed to allow an animal to suffer needlessly she was also, as Prince Philip confirmed to his cousin David Milford Haven, whose girlfriend at the time confirmed it to me, she was a goer. <laughs> she loved, loved the, shall we say, conjugal side of marriage yes she did and when i wrote my book on their royal on their marriage uh, which was published in i think 2016 or some such thing i don't remember now maybe 2018 but whenever it was published uh, it was called the queen's marriage i think the mirror was aghast that I had said that she liked the pleasurable side of matrimony. Well, she wasn't so aghast, was she? I mean, she's the one who signed off on me being the only writer to do the script for her commemorative stamps for her 95th birthday and then her platinum jubilee. So she can't have been that upset, quite obviously. In fact, she wasn't upset at all because she was very down to earth. And if you weren't being disrespectful, she also got where you were coming from. I mean, sometimes with great humor. I mean, there is the famous meeting of her at the palace with one of the football players in the early days of mobile phones and his phone goes off and he's very embarrassed and she says oh no 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 you must answer it it might be someone important <laughs> i mean really that's you know graceful to the nth degree isn't it she also understood the importance of getting the balance right politically 
Now, she was not a party politician. She was above party politics. Uh, it is said that Prince Philip and the Queen both were rather more pink than her parents. And I think there is a measure of truth there. Uh, I would have said she was, as am I, a liberal conservative, small l, small c. Of what I know privately of her worldly opinions, because she would never discuss party politics, but she would discuss world events. She was a truly liberal conservative. She wanted to conserve that which was worth conserving and gradually and constructively alter that which should be improved upon. She was a very politically astute in a way, in my opinion, that the King and Prince William have not yet demonstrated that they share this quality to the extent that she possessed it. But it's, I can't go into this now. It's, it would be, that itself would take up two hours. But she was very much a realist. She was, she didn't deal in wishful thinking or fantasies. She accepted things and people as they were and tried to make the best of a situation, whatever it was. She accepted the realities even when she didn't like them and even when she would have preferred something different. I think that is a very important quality to possess if you are going to have a public life that is going to be constructive because otherwise you waste an awful lot of time and energy running up primrose paths that lead to rotting cottages. She was very humane, but she accepted the fact that life isn't perfect, that people aren't perfect, and she would move on. Some people would have said she was forgiving. I would have said she was accepting. So let's get to her personal relationships. So let's start with her relationship with Prince Philip. Well, as I say, I wrote a whole book on that. So I'm not going to go into it in such detail. People who want to know the reality of her relationship with Prince Philip can read my book, The Queen's Marriage, or Giles Brandreth's book, on the same subject, or indeed both of them, because we accord in some respects and we have different takes on certain things and we describe different aspects of their lives, which is as it ought to be. The Queen first properly met Prince Philip at the Royal Naval College, Dartmouth, in 1938, I think it was. It might have been 39. I think it was 38, but it could have been 39. When Lord Mountbatten, who was responsible for the King and Queen's trip, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, who were, became Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Uh, he roped in his nephew, Prince Philip of Greece, to entertain the girls. And Lilibet was smitten 
from the word go. I have to tell you, I can understand why she was. Prince Philip and Sean Connery were the two men of all the men I've met, including macho guys like Steve McQueen. Sean Connery and Prince Philip were the two men who oozed masculinity through every pore and in the most appealing way possible. And Prince Philip was gorgeous looking when he was young. He went away, he was in the war. She then became very friendly with Porchy Porchester, whose family owned Highclere Castle, which is very near to Windsor Castle. Now, all of this is now taking place during the Second World War. Lilibet and her younger sister, Margaret, are billeted primarily at Windsor Castle. The king and queen sleep at Windsor Castle and drive into London to Buckingham Palace every day. And on weekends they're at Windsor. But by and large, they are in London during the day, but the girls are at Windsor Castle the whole time. And as the war continued, it remember it lasted for nearly six years. So they both grew up in wartime and all of the young naval officers, all of the young army officers who were on leave, all of the all of the young officers who were guarding the king, the queen, the princesses, the Windsor, they would have parties with them and the local friends would be roped in as well. They'd roll up the carpet, put on the gramophone and dance. Porchy Porchester who was the heir to the Earl of Carnarvon, was one of those men. He was more or less the Queen's age and he was very good looking. She developed a crush on him. At the time, she still corresponded with Prince Philip, but you know, she was 16 years old and Prince Philip was away and she was 15, 16 years old. Uh, and like all 15 and 16 year olds, that which is nearby might have more appeal than that which is far away. Also, her mother did not want her to marry a royal. Her mother wanted her to marry an aristocrat. And of course, Prince Philip was a very royal. He was far more royal than Princess Elizabeth, as she then was. Far more royal than Queen Elizabeth, who became Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mother, because she was basically aristocratic with some royal descent. And George VI was royal, but also had a morganatic strain in his background from his grandmother. No, his mother. Sorry, his mother. Queen Mary who was the product of a morganatic union. Now, Philip also was the product of a morganatic union, but it was that much further back. And Philip had a lot of very grand royal blood in him, far grander than Queen Mary had. So 
I make that point for what it's worth because it actually was a factor in print in Queen Elizabeth, the, who, the, the mother, I should say the mother because you're going to get confused. Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, the mother of Princess Elizabeth, knew that the royals, especially the exiled royals, but all the royals, looked down on her. For instance, Princess Marina, the Duchess of Kent, used to call her and Princess Alice, the Duchess of Gloucester, those common little Scots girls. <laughs> so, Elizabeth did not want Lilibet to marry royalty. And she would have been delighted had she married an aristocrat. And she had a list including the then Duke of Rutland, who married my stepsister-in-law. But that's another story. I'm not going to sidetrack too much. Because, but King George VI said, I'll be absolutely, mm -mm, and I have to delete the word because it's very fruity, and colourful and salty and naval, and he was a naval officer, if you remember. Uh, I will be, mm -mm, if my daughter is going to marry any, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> son of a butler, <laughs> because Porchy Porchester was supposed to be an Aaron's baby, and his second wife, Tilly Losh, used to go around saying that he and his sister were Aaron's babies, and that his official father, Lord Carnarvon, who actually I knew he was a great, very naughty old man, loved the girls. But he was evidently sterile. And with his first wife, he had a son and a daughter. And they were both evidently Aaron's babies. Dr. Aaron's was a fashionable obstetrician and gynecologist who had an in to providing heirs where there was a problem with conception and he his supply was the butlers good looking butlers in those days to be a butler to an aristocratic household meant that you had to be intelligent capable of managerial skills you had to have social skills you had to ha be good looking butlers were invariably good looking usually tall i'd never known of a butler that was short uh, in those days they were all tall so they were actually superb breeding stock and he had a supply of butlers who would go into one room or uh, do what needed to be done into and it was all very medically done so uh, the receptacle would be a surgical tray it would be then taken next door to and administered administered uh, but it was well known in grand circles how true it is, of course, is another matter altogether, that Porchy Porchester was an Aaron's baby. So George VI put his foot down and they remained friends all their lives. 
and we'll come back to him in a little. Actually, no, we'll, we'll interject right now. Later on, people would say that the queen had had an affair with Porchy because they were great friends. It's totally untrue. And people would say that Prince Andrew was her son with Porchy. Totally untrue. Prince Andrew looks like Prince Philip's uncle. Also, Porchy, who became Lord Carnarvon, and as those of you who are uh, look at Downton Abbey might know, the Carnarvon house is Highclere Castle, which is Downton Abbey in the television series. Well, the Queen was very friendly with Jeannie Porchester, who then became Jeannie Carnarvon, and who was born Jeannie Wallop. Uh, and she was a very pretty American who was of British descent from an aristocratic background. The Wallops are, if I remember correctly, the Earls of Plymouth. I could be wrong. It begins with P. <laughs> uh, but I think it's Earls of Plymouth. But she was born and brought up in Wyoming. And in fact, her brother was the senator for Wyoming. And I've had the pleasure of entertaining his wife, French Hair. Oh, lovely, lovely woman, fascinating. But anyway, there was no truth to that rumour, just as there was no truth to the rumour that the Queen had an affair with Patrick Plunkett, who was the deputy master of the royal household. He was Lord Plunkett and he was supposed to be the father of Prince Edward, because ironically enough, Patrick Plunkett's youngest brother, Sean, who was a great friend of mine, and Prince Edward looked slightly alike. But Sean and I got together when Nigel Dempster, the gossip columnist, had spoken was spreading the story that Patrick was the father of Prince Edward, having spread the story that Porchy Carnarvon was the father of Andrew. And I'll tell you why he did it. He did it because after he wrote Princess Margaret's biography, he expected to be knighted, and when he wasn't, he did it as pure spite. But anyway... That was Nigel, he could be a nasty piece of work. And Sean and I got together, knocked heads together. And in my book, The Royal Marriages, I pretty much blew that story out of the water with Sean's assistance. Uh, because Patrick Plunkett was gay. <laughs> so anyway, so now we, the Queen and Prince Philip, yeah, their marriage did sometimes have its rocky periods, as do all marriages, and certainly marriages with men who were as masculine as Prince Philip could at times be trying. But he loved her and she loved him. I know this as a fact. They loved each other dearly and they respected each other dearly. But they weren't in each other's pockets. They had joint interests in that their great concern was the monarchy. They had uh, various interests in common in terms of social welfare, etc., and the economy and the good of the country, but they had divergent interests and divergent tastes. Prince Philip, notwithstanding that he was an excellent polo player, was not horse mad the way the Queen was. 
uh, he was more esoteric, as I have said, than she was. You know, he would go on delving into Carl Jung. I mean, the Queen had no interest in Carl Jung, none whatsoever. So, but they, like very successful marriages, they had joint enterprises and separate enterprises which fed themselves separately and was a good thing in the long term. Prince Philip was a terribly good flirt, I've got to tell you. He never saw a pretty girl that he didn't have a nice comment for her. Really. <laughs> but he had four elder sisters and he loved women. I think people often confused that with his, uh, that, and, and thought that because he was a lot of flirting show, he was a lot of actual go. That was not my take on Prince Philip at all. And Giles Brandreth and I are in total agreement on this subject. Also, Prince Philip had not only male friends, he had female friends. The Queen had female friends as well as male friends. Her friends usually, though, were people who shared interests with her. Uh, for instance, Paul Cheap Carnarvon, he became her racing manager. They spoke every day about her horses. Uh, but she had other friends, for instance, the Plunkett brothers. Sean, after Patrick died, Patrick Plunkett died, he died young of cancer. <clears throat> and the Queen had instructed that she be informed immediately as he died. And he died during an investiture. And uh, she, they interrupted the investiture and she burst out into tears. He was her foster brother. The three Plunkett brothers had been brought up partly by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother as she became, and King George VI, and partly by Lady Londonry after their parents died in a plane crash in 1938, going to or coming from San Simeon, the William Randolph Hearst. Oh, Xanadu, <laughs> really fabulous place. And so they were effectively her foster brothers. And I have seen pictures that Sean's son, Tyrone, who's the present Lord Plunkett has, of him up at Balmoral with his children and the Queen, taken very, very shortly before her death. The Queen kept up with her friends. She loved her friends. She was nurtured by her friends. She was extremely sociable, as indeed was Prince Philip. They loved entertaining. Both of them loved entertaining. And they had the perfect mix of personal friends with people they had to entertain. For instance, they had to always ask bishops and functionaries and people like that uh, for weekends, but they would intermingle it with their close friends who were people like the Plunkets. I'm not sure actually. <laughs> I should mention any other names because some of them might not want me to mention their names so I won't mention any names but she was very friendly as well with her cousins now I'll tell you to show that what her way of life was her cousin Margaret Rose her first cousin always called her Lilibet but Margaret's children called her Ma'am. 
Patrick's brothers and Patrick and Sean's son, etc., always called her ma'am. I mean, obviously, when they were children, Patrick and Sean called her Lilibet. But once she was queen, they always called her ma'am. Nobody ever forgot that she was queen. And she never forgot that she was queen. Which is why when Diana first married Charles and was freaking out at Balmoral, it came as such a shock to everybody concerned that anybody could speak about the Queen, even if only in casual reference, the way Diana was screaming to Charles about running off and having lunch with mummy. People were horrified. She kept up with her friends. She kept up with her cousins. Uh, she and her sister, Princess Margaret, were very close. But she was very, you're my sister. I accept things privately, but she never, ever confused the role of monarch and sister. And this caused a lot of bitterness when Princess Margaret uh, was hoping to marry Peter Townsend and there were the problems that arose because Princess Margaret did not realize it, but the Queen had behind the scenes got all of the restrictions and objections lifted, except that she could no longer be in the right of succession. She was going to be able to keep her title. She was going to be able to keep her payment on the civil list, which was very important because she had no money. Her father had died uh, unexpectedly and had made no allowances for her. And her mother never, ever made her financially independent, and she could have. So the, qu the queen organized this behind the scenes and the private secretary informed Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's private secretary, who, who informed Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and she never informed Princess Margaret. It was a very long time before Princess Margaret found out what had really happened. And believe me, she held it against her mother. Uh, she was also a very loving grandmother and she was a loving mother and mother-in-law. She was very busy when Charles and Anne were very young and she was struggling to cope with being queen because she became queen at the age of 25 when they were very young. And she was much more relaxed as a mother with Andrew and Edward and had far more easygoing relationships or less restricted relationships would, or less formalized relationships would be a better way of putting it. But even with Anne and Charles, she always tried to be there for bedtime and bath time, that sort of thing, if she could make it. And she was also a very agreeable and accommodating mother-in-law. And she had a lot to accommodate, let me tell you. First of all, there was Sarah's and her antics. Oh, uh, which the Queen never ever held against Sarah and she always remained on cordial terms with Sarah whom she liked. I know this as a fact. She liked Sarah. 
she felt Sarah's heart was in the right place, even if everything else wasn't at various times. She also loved Sophie. I think she loved Sarah as well, in fairness to Sarah, but she certainly loved Sophie, absolutely loved Sophie. And with good reason, because Sophie was a wonderful daughter-in-law to her. And she was fond of Diana, but she found Diana very difficult to handle, as did everybody else as did Diana herself. Diana found herself hard to handle. So, but she was as accommodating as she could be. And also the Queen and had made a mistake initially with Charles and Diana that she made with Margaret and Lord Snowden because everybody knew Princess Margaret could be very tricky and difficult. So when her marriage started to unravel, both the Queen and Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, actually, initially, and to an extent actually always took Lord Snowden's side because they only ever saw sweet, nice Tony. They never saw mean, nasty Tony. And Princess Margaret, if she said anything, they thought she was dramatizing and exaggerating. And in fact, Princess Margaret was more in the right than Tony Snowden. She made a similar mistake with Charles and Diana in the early days, because Charles, she, everybody knew, could be very sort of oversensitive and fussy and a bit of, uh, well, you get the point. I mean, you only need to look at him to see what he can be like. He's a good man. He's a kind man. He's a very committed man. But he always was a bit of a fuddy-duddy. And the Queen and Prince Philip's relationship with him had been affected by the fact that her mother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, used to undermine them and overindulge Charles. She used to say Charles is so sensitive and they used to think Charles needs to be toughened up. She used to think, oh, he needs to be indulged. And she caused a lot of problems in that relationship between their eldest son and them. I've been into this in my book, so if you're really interested in the nitty gritty and, and the minutiae, I think you, I'm afraid you, I don't have the time for this. You need to read the books. Uh, but as things went on and on, and as she realized that Diana was, well, let me rephrase that because at the very outset on the honeymoon, they all realized that Diana was extremely uh, verbose and extremely moody and extremely prone to tears and drama. And they realized that there was a problem with Diana. But as the marriage continued and Diana refused help, and when the marriage broke down, Diana was very good at making out even to Charles's parents that she was the injured party and that he was the one who was to blame. And to an extent, at first, they were very sympathetic towards her and less understanding towards him because they thought, oh, he's spoiled. They didn't realize she spoiled as well. And they knew she was a little bit unstable, but they didn't really realize that she was quite as devious and manipulative as she was. And it was only towards the end of the marriage that they realized the Queen and Prince Philip 
realized. So Diana had run rings around all of them and that she was not the sweet and innocent victim that she had portrayed herself as being, but that she could be a piece of work. And at that point, both Prince Philip and the Queen started to treat Diana with kid gloves. They were still nice to her because, of course, she was the mother of their grandsons. And but they stopped sympathizing with her and started to see the big picture where the whole of the marriage was concerned and that in fact there was greater fault on Diana's side than on Charles's side and not saying there wasn't fault on both sides but that the marriage could never have worked because and that they needed to be careful of Diana well to wrap up with the grandchildren and their spouses, the queen grew ever increasingly to respect and to really respect is the right word, Catherine Wales, as she now is. The queen helped to train up Prince William the way her grandmother, Queen Mary, and King George VI had trained her up to become monarch. She was training up Prince William, and you can see the effects of that input very positively. She liked Catherine, and she grew to like her an awful lot more as Catherine grew into the role and she realized that Catherine would make an absolutely superb queen. She liked the other grandchildren's spouses and got along with all of them. And even when there were marital problems and they got divorced, for instance, Peter and Autumn Phillips, she was very phlegmatic. She liked Meghan at first. She and King Charles both liked Meghan at first. My understanding is that Prince Philip saw through her from the word go, as did Princess Anne. The two main ones saw Meghan coming a mile off. But everybody went along with it because if they had not gone along with it, the threat which was voiced to them was that they would be accused of being racist and it had nothing to do with Meghan's race. In fact, they loved the fact that she was mixed race. That was one of the main things that she had going for her and I tell you, without that, I don't think the marriage would have taken place. I think they would have clamped down and said absolutely not. But the race card hovered over them from before the wedding. And you needn't ask who would have been playing it. I think we can all imagine who would have been playing it and why they were playing it to get their own way. And by the time Harry and Meghan, well, my understanding is that she gradually uh, came to realize that, and when she was gradually made aware, I should rephrase that, of the troubles within Meghan's 
modus operandi and her determination to impose the Meganian way on the royal family and on doing things. And I can go into this in greater detail. I don't think we have enough time. But what I will say is that the time I wrote my book and and by the time I was writing my book, I should say, the Queen was absolutely horrified as to what Meghan was and what her possibilities were. Some of the descriptions from the Queen are in the last few pages of my book. They are deeply unflattering and I have other descriptions that the Queen subsequently used about Meghan, all of which are very unflattering and indicative of the fact that the Queen knew exactly what she was dealing with. She was not duped. And on the other hand, she did not want to pour fuel on fire she was she wanted to pour sand on the fire and she hoped for the first year that they would return when it became apparent that they wouldn't and after the oprah interview my understanding is that she was beyond horrified that at some of the things they were saying and that they could have done this at a time that Prince Philip was dying. Then her phlegmatism kicked in and she and she knew that Harry was going to be writing his memoirs, but she had already covered the fact that, because you see, she knew that Harry was deeply disordered and she also knew that Harry had always had problems, let's put it that way. From he was a little boy, Harry was problematic. She loved him, but she wasn't blind to, to him and she was quite phlegmatic. She, I don't think she realized that Harry was going to say and do some of the things he said and did. I think had she lived to see what he said and did in both the Netflix program with Meghan and in his book, Spare Me Please from All of This Rubbish. Oh, sorry, that's my take on it. I think it was just called Spare. I think she would have been beyond horrified and felt very betrayed. In fact, I know that's how she felt. I'm not going to say how I know, but I know that's how she felt. And on that note, I will say, I thought she was a really delightful woman, delightful to meet, delightful to have been a part of all our lives. I think we are very lucky to have not only we, the British people, to have had such a wonderful monarch, but I think the world is lucky to have seen what a head of state of that magnitude and that predisposition and that commitment can be. She really is the living testament of how superb a constitutional monarch can be and what good they can bring to the world because but for Queen Elizabeth II I don't think the Commonwealth would be in existence today. There were many times when it was close to collapsing, but 
the things she cared about most were the crown and the commonwealth. She was the queen of several different states, including the United Kingdom, and she was the head of the Commonwealth, and she was deeply committed to the Commonwealth. She was deeply committed to doing good, to being a good person, and doing good with her life in this world, and hopefully leaving a good legacy. And I think she succeeded brilliantly. So I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please keep the questions and comments coming in so I will know what you would like us to speak about. Okay, thank you so much. God bless. Goodbye. And if you have really enjoyed this, may I ask you to please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and God speed. Thank you. Bye-bye.